This is Surviving the Hunger Games. Are the odds ever in your favor? I am Dr. Travis Langley, professor of psychology, best known as the author of the book Batman and Psychology, A Dark and Stormy Night, editor and lead writer on a lot of other books where we talk about the psychology of heroes and villains and how we survive anything. Panelist, who are you? I am Jenna Bush, uh, B-U-S-C-H, like the beer, not the president. Um, I am a writer and host for places like Sci-Fi Wire and Vital Thrills, um, co-host of a podcast called Hysterical about history. I'm a contributing author to the Psych Geeks book series, and um, I used to co-host a show with Stan Lee. I'm America Young, and I am a director, stunt performer, stunt coordinator, and I, in, in terms of my fandom of Hunger Games, not, have, not only read all the books and the movies, seen the movies, but I was also in a Mockingjay Burn fan video, and uh, Kamadiva did a series called Banff Girls, in which I played Katniss. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Wind Goodfriend. I am a psychology professor at a small private school in Iowa. I have contributed to a lot of the books edited by Travis on uh, psychology and popular culture. Um, beyond that, I'm probably more well known for the textbooks that I write. I've written four psychology textbooks. And um, the one that's probably the most popular is Psychology. It won the Best Textbook of the Year Award last year. So that's All exciting right. for me. Congratulations. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Dr. Deidre Garriott. I'm a lecturer in the Department of English at the University of South Carolina and their Writing Center Director. And I am best known for being an editor and contributor to a book um, by McFarland Press called Space and Place in the Hunger Games. Um, new readings of the trilogy. Alex Langley, I am an author of numerous books such as Make a Nerdy Living, Kill the Freshman, and the Geek Handbook series. I am also a social psychologist and a contributor to the Psych Geek series. So hello everyone, I'm Steve Huff. I am an edged weapons and combative specialist, a fight choreographer, martial arts instructor, and actor performer. Now, a couple of our panelists wanted to discuss uh, what weapon you would each hope to use if you were having to fight in the Hunger Games. So let's start with the ones who suggested that question. You know, what weapons are you eager to talk about? As a psychologist, of course, I would have to use psychological manipulation to get my enemies to trust me and let their guard down. And then after I got close to them, I actually used to own a martial arts studio, so I would just, you know, karate chop them to death. <laughs> so it's a little bit like the strategy of the uh, Survivor show, where the ones who win, it's like you first get people on your sure. side. Sure. And use and, them and, and turn against them. Okay. That's right. And act very weak so that you're not perceived as a threat. Well, I do not look very intimidating, so I think I would definitely start with making people think that I am not scary. Um, because, yeah, I, I'm really not scary. Um, but I would, of course, use a bow and arrow, not because Katniss does, but because I'm a video game player and I'm a huge fan of ranged weapons. I feel like you can hide and shoot very well. Um, and I was a makeup artist, so I can also paint myself into stuff like PETA. Ultimately, I think I would like a, a long bladed type weapon, you know, like a machete or a bat lift, because I feel like that can be used, you don't have to reload it, first of all, you don't have to run out of ammo, and it can be used as a tool for survival, for cutting down things you need to survive in whatever environment you're in. That's ultimately, I thought about long range weapons and explosive, but ultimately this felt like, this felt like the best bet. I would use my mouth, because I am very good at talking my way into trouble and i'm almost as good at talking my way out of trouble so i would just flipper to gibbet my way through the hunger games i would rely on probably getting a crap ton of sponsors beforehand who would just constantly rain stuff down on me because i have no useful survival skills otherwise so lots and lots of talking I don't think I have any survivor, <laughs> survival skills at all. I'm going to be the first one to die. Um, so maybe I should just throw that one out. Is I'm going to be killed the moment the Hunger Games starts. But if I could do anything, I, I am a rhetorician. Um, I teach and study persuasion. So I would try to persuade people to be my allies, get them on my side, and maybe sneakily kill them with like poison or something. 
if if I manage to make it past, you know, the cornucopia. Steve, you know weapons better than any of the rest of us. What would you pick? Yeah, I'm I'm kind of afraid to like turn my back on anybody here. Uh, honestly, I I would go with a good trusty knife um, for both the combative aspects as well as the survival aspects. A good trusty knife, I can get all the other things that I need. And just to, just to show our audience that we definitely have opinions about these books and films and to show that we do know something about them, do you each have a favorite or least favorite uh, book or film? Anybody? Um, I, I guess uh, I'll start. Uh, Catching Fire is definitely my favorite. Um, and bo both book and movie. And I think particularly with the movies, um, for me, it's the first one you're sort of establishing characters but i think with the second one you bring in more interesting ones and it becomes because you already know katniss peta gail um Hamage, uh effie but when you then when you're bringing in joanna and Beatty and wyrus and like i i think that that's such a cool group and particularly i had read the books first so particularly knowing what happens with everybody um i found them all fascinating so that's why that one's my favorite I would say the first Hunger Games is my favorite. It, um, I feel like it tells a, it's a cleaner story where Katniss, I feel like she gets a little more passive in each entry in the trilogy as we go on to where she's getting led around by her nose a little more by the other characters. Whereas in the first one, she's kind of actively dealing in this situation the same as anybody else. Plus the first one I think has the most of that kind of the perverse pageantry of the Hunger Games. You know, that that you get plenty of in the second one, but then the third one is basically lacking entirely. And uh, I, I think that, that perverse pageantry is something that really makes The Hunger Games interesting and really makes it stand out uh, compared to a lot of its other dystopic YA contemporaries. For me, the first was the best, um, partially just because I like the introduction of the dystopian world and, mm -hmm. and uh, the kind of history of how they got to where they were. I also really found it kind of personally disturbing to enjoy the first book so much mm -hmm. because the point or one of the main points of, of the trilogy is um, the idea that the games themselves are popular for this really perverse reason, right? Like people are watching other people get killed and that's really weird that you would want to watch that. But we as fans of the books and movies are the ones enjoying that. So it's kind of this uncomfortable meta experience and i had that the most when i read and watched the first that catching fire um both the film and the book are my favorite um even though it suffers from being a, a middle book in a in a trilogy um so we need the big theme of the first book and we need the final book to so get the end of the story but i think as someone who so my research focuses on on public memory um it's interesting to see how um the capital manipulates PETA and Katniss to um, perpetuate a particular mythology about the capital, about the Hunger Games, um, and we get to to see a little bit more of the trauma that they um, experience as fallout or surviving the Hunger Games, um, and that you're know, kind of returning to our theme, that issue of do you actually survive the Hunger Games? Um, but I can't say it's necessarily a pleasant read, and I agree with Alex, Katniss is much more passive as the books go on. Yeah, I actually uh, really enjoyed the first one. Um, you know, I, I had come into it not being familiar with the books before seeing the films, and for me, seeing the way they established the, you know, the different levels of the society, and then even among the different districts, you really get to see that rivalry that is kept there and keeping them from from being able to to put aside their differences and then just seeing that that introduction to the games themselves and you really get a sense of the horror that it brings into the lives of these people how in the world does somebody prepare for the hunger games so these people grow up in a society where they all know it's possible but it's not going to affect most of them so most people will not spend their lives really preparing for this. You have a limited amount of time to prepare. So what do you prepare? Mentally or skills? How do you prepare for the Hunger Games? Right. You know, that is, 
that is something that I just kept asking myself watching it the first time, because we're, we're not talking about professional soldiers. We're not talking about anybody whose life is dedicated to, to fighting. You know, these, these are children, you know, they're, they're, they're children that are possibly having to go off to not only to fight to survive, but to have to kill to survive. And I just, I don't think there is a way that mentally you can ever really prepare yourself for that. What it comes down to in, in when you're dealing with like high threat, high, uh, high stress response situations, it, it comes down to training the body to respond instinctively, taking elements of, of your already you know, existing personality and learning how to best accentuate them when you get into a high threat, high stress situation where you're not going to have a lot of time to think. Um, with weapons training, that's why you do so many drills because it has to get to that point where it's response without really thinking about it, but it just can't be response without thought. You know, that, that's how you get killed. So a lot of it is just focusing on the main goal and trying to just take everything, every other distraction and put it aside. It's hard. Most people aren't training for it, right? So that's why there's such a high body count right at the top, because these are all the people who have just been surviving. These are the people who are just at the bare necessity of survival. They don't get enough food to eat. They don't get enough warm clothes. They don't get enough exercise. Um, so to train for the Hunger Games, you, it's, it's, I would think it's more about the marathon of it and the stamina of it. And as, I hate this part, but the ability to cause harm to somebody else. That, that is something you need to learn how to switch out of. Because as a human race, our, thankfully, the majority of us, our knee-jerk response is to not, how not to hurt someone. And, it, and you have to push through that mental thing that, that pushes you into actually causing pain and then to actually kill someone. So that's where the training should come in, is how to commit murder and be a sociopath. Because I have a tendency to try to over prepare for situations I'm never going to be in. Like, you know, if I were in space and this happened, what would I do? I don't know why I do this, but I do. So I have a feeling probably if I lived in one of those societies, I probably would have looked at every little thing I do. Like if I'm hunting like Katniss or if I'm, although wouldn't that be weird because I'm a vegetarian, but still plant gathering, that sort of thing. I'd probably be like, if I ever get in the Hunger Games, what would I use this for? I have a feeling I'd end up doing that. I also wonder too if there's a community element to it. So we're not just talking about like the physical preparation, but sort of uh, a, a community based preparation. So one of the things that we see in the Hunger Games is that Katniss doesn't have a close relationship with her mother um, and is very distant from many of her her peers. And while we could just attribute this to Katniss being <laughs> standoffish, um, I think there's also a reality knowing that every year someone is going to be chosen to die and it could be your or child be. or it could be your peers right so i think there's maybe some emotion I, i'm not in psychology at all so i don't know i'm just thinking about this from a, a, a literary perspective and the relationship that Katniss does and does not build and how difficult it is for her and i feel like that's a fallout from the hunger games and that's also preparation for it um not being close to other people because they could be someone that you have to face they could be an opponent the mindset of Katniss is that you're talking about is also that's something that was instilled in her from an early age from when her father died prematurely and I think that a lot of the other people who live in the the poorer districts probably have that same mentality because uh it's drilled into their heads that you know life is not something that should be expected no one has any kind of a life expectancy because it could be snatched away at any time with the case of the poor the children from poorer families they're buying extra chances into the hunger games to get just some meager provisions right mm -hmm. so there's that too i mean the odds aren't in their favor and we see katniss and and gail really mocking that the beginning of of the hunger games because they know um the that the, their chances are grim in terms of of the lottery I also see a uh, kind of a correlation between sort of physically preparing to be a killer if you are you know chosen as tribute and um, kind of a loss of your humanity you know we see the career tributes sort of universally are 
a holes. I'm, I, can I can I say that? Monsters. <laughs> and then you'd see, you know, people like Rue, who you know is at the bottom of the list in terms of the odds being in her favor. She's you know the most wonderful person <laughs> in the competition. So um, so it's interesting to think about. Am I preparing simply to survive, which I think is the mentality of most people? Or kind of like what Peta says at the beginning, um, am I preparing to get through this while maintaining my humanity? And I think also with um, with some of the characters like Rue or Foxface, they're not so much preparing to be killers as they're preparing to like, they're trying to focus on whatever skills they already have that might help them out. Like Rue definitely, at no point do we get any indication that she was training to learn how to kill people. She just wanted to out hide others and run away from others and just hope that she would be the last person standing because everybody else had wiped each other out. Katniss does that at a point at the beginning. Um, it's not until um, she cuts down the, the, the um, what are they called? The jacker, the, um, like the wasps. The tracker jackers. Tracker yeah, jackers. Yeah, tracker jackers. Um, that we see her actively harming um, one of one of the contestants, and it's really more out of defense. She needs to get out of a tree. But for a long time, Katniss is sur surviving on her skills as well, and not actively seeking out. And so it's interesting that um, Katniss sort of rebuffs Peta when he says, "You know, I want to come out of this as authentically as possible." But yet we see at the very beginning that that's kind of what she's doing. Well, and she admits, like I, I. She says something like, I can't afford that kind of mentality, right? right. Because I have to get back and protect my sister and my mom. And, and so she kind of acknowledges I have to give up some of who I would yeah. like to be to, in order to physically survive this. Yeah. What kind of person wants to be in the Hunger Games? <gasps> some places people regularly volunteer, but even in the real world, people will enter very dangerous behaviors. Why would people, why would someone do this? What kind of person does that? We could easily say they're all psychopaths and they would have a higher rate, but no, that's not all there is to it. I definitely see Steve shaking his head there. It, one of the things that it, it obviously made me think of was gladiatorial combat. And there were a surprisingly high number of free people that went in to become gladiators simply because that was the best option that they had. So somebody that might volunteer for it, it might be for their family. And then, of course, you, know, you obviously have Katniss who does it for, to save her sister, but for others, that might be the only chance they will ever have at something better. Yeah, I mean, it's because it's a, it's a rigged system, you know. Uh, I, I think that to try to place the blame on any one individual is... Um, I, I, there's not as much blame that falls on the individuals. Like, sure, there's going to be somebody who's just inherently bloodthirsty, but like statistically speaking, that's going to be extremely rare. But we're going to have a lot more of our people who are so ground down or pushed in place by this rigged system that the capital has set up that they are electing to go into the Hunger Games because they think it's their only option. It's not that you've got these these bad actors, these bad apples ruining everything by just being murderers because it's fun. You have it that the capital has set up a system that benefits them and makes life harder for the vast, vast majority of people. If your family is so poor and you're starving and you're trying to bring some sort of stability and you actually think you have a chance of winning, or if you like to hurt people, that would be the other person that would but if you're a good person, it's, it's, it's a sacrifice for others. You're being a martyr. The career people are different, but if you live in a district where your life is pretty crappy anyway, um, you know, you might consider joining just to figure, my life's going to be short anyway, so I might as well enjoy it and be proud of it and have all of these wonderful things happening to me. You know, even like with the careers, they're, they're choosing to train and choosing to have a purpose. Um, you know, if you grow up in a place where there is one industry and you just you can't imagine your life doing that industry, you figure, well, you know, I'll just, I'll try that. Might as well give it a shot. I also think of people who tend to like to do really sort of risky things like um, bungee jumping or, or extreme sports or things like that who might be, you know, adrenaline junkies. I am not a psychologist, so I'm just guessing there. I don't have that in me at all there's no bungee jumping but i would imagine people who who for whom risk is um exciting might try that 
remember that the district gets rewarded for um, for the for the um, tribute who wins. So there's also an opportunity not just to help yourself, not just to get into Victor's Village um, and, you know, enjoy a better life personally, but you also help your community. And we do see the bonds of community in the books and the movies and how important that is, um, that it's through community or the lack of it that, that people survive. Alex brought up the issue of classism, how the rich kids are pitting the poor against each other. And I'd already thought about a comparison with prisons. Uh, one of the ways that the small number of guards uh, keep everybody from not just overwhelming the guards is by encouraging racism, encouraging people to form groups that will hate each other within the prison. The, the lottery system that we've been talking about, how the poorer your family is, the more you end up being encouraged to put your name in more so that your family gets additional resources. And this causes infighting, even at the beginning of the Hunger Games, Katniss refers to how in District 12, you know, the that Gail dislikes the mayor's kid because she only had to put her name in once because even though they're poor as dirt, just like everybody at District 12, they're not quite as poor as dirt as everyone else. And so that is encouraging that infighting, encouraging people to you know, to get mad at the people who, for whom, you know, the fault does not lie, instead of getting angry at the people who created the unfair system. And, right. and this is a real problem in the real world. And, and for me, um, I've spent some time as a social psychologist, um, just like Alex, you know, studying prejudice. And uh, I went to Rwanda for a summer and studied the genocide from 1994. And we have the Hutus and the Tutsis who for hundreds of years really didn't have much fighting, got along just fine. And then white colonists came in, pitted them against each other, and now we have a genocide. So it's, it's really this idea of people who have power, you know, kind of distracting you <laughs> from, from attacking them by making you attack each other. And, and we, we have a lot of um, similar examples of this in real life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the boss encouraging the customers to get mad at the employees who are on strike for unfair wages instead of getting mad at the boss who's not paying anybody very well. It's this, this division that keeps happening, right? Just in terms of the districts and pitting the districts against each other, pitting children and essentially families against each other, um, making like poverty into an actual striation um so we don't like each other right these are all these efforts that the government is doing and we're seeing them happening right now so the Hunger games is a modern is a modern day it's a different version of the gladiator war where you where you have you cause these these people to pick sides and root against each other instead of the bigger problem which is how the capital ultimately was able to keep everyone down. Not only was it the fear of their kids being in the Hunger Games, but it became about the districts fighting each other and having, um, having their own uh, issues against each other for various reasons. You know, they, they, they had their own uh, sociological issues with the different. So then they're not focusing on the, ga the capital, which is, which is ultimately the puppet master. And I think that's fascinating. And I think that uh, civilizations have done that across time in the world where they pit people against each other so that the people are focusing on the fight right in front of them and not focusing on the diabolical things happening above their heads. These conflicts at every level also appeal to us as viewers. Mm -hmm. although, yeah. although it works better with specific faces. I know Wind and Jenna wanted to talk about that love triangle uh, yeah. at, at the level of the specific faces. With Is this a necessary conflict? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, for me, I don't, I don't mind it because what I think is so interesting is, you know, I, I mean, I'm 47, so, you know, I've grown up with, um, with love triangles and love this, and every story has to have a love story. And look, I love love. Love is lovely, but <laughs> I think it's really interesting to, to see a, a protagonist, particularly a female protagonist, say like, I don't have time for this, like. Which one of us are you going to choose? You know what? I'm going to try not to die first, and then I'll think about that. And though, you know, she's still a teenage girl. She's still going back and forth between them. She's still um, discussing her relationship here and there. But, but really, her focus is less about 
about which one she's picking for the most part and more about how she's going to survive. And, you know, there are a couple things that are very interesting in there that are, you know, that, um, you know, Gail says to her, like, I, she's going to go, or he, he's, I think he says it to, to Peta, she's going to go with the person that she can't live without. Um, so it's mm -hmm. less about like, who's going to like me and more like who is important to my survival as a person and my, my thriving as a person. You don't see that with a lot of, a lot of protagonists, particularly female protagonists, you know, and also she's a very, as much as I hesitate to say strong female characters, like she's, she's a, a very strong character and she, she takes a different role, I think, than, than normally, um, we see in, in YA where you have one of the guys who is less physically powerful. He is more willing to hide. He's, he's more willing to sort of bend to make other people feel good, which is a lovely quality, but it's not, just not something you see in a male lead very often. Um, so I just like the way everything is sort of turned on its head and how we're, we're seeing a very different uh, priority for the protagonist. One of the things that I always find fascinating is um, this tr struggle that she has choosing between Gail and Peta because I think in other circumstances she would have ended up with Gail. And, um, you know, in social psych we have this phenomenon called sometimes excitation transfer or sometimes misattribution of arousal where you um, kind of trick yourself into thinking that you're attracted to someone or, or in love with someone and it's really because of the situation. And it's because you've gone through um, maybe a trauma together or the adrenaline of the situation has caused you to kind of feel your own mortality or, or, um, or just the physical arousal you interpret as sexual arousal, basically. And so, you know, in the Hunger Games, they're constantly in these situations where they're about to die. And PETA happens to be right there. So social psychology would have predicted that she ended up with PETA, if nothing else, because the environment had their adrenaline pumping. Whereas I think if things had been otherwise, she certainly would have ended up with Gail instead. Mm -hmm. Also that, uh, they talk about that phenomenon in Speed of all movies, kind of at the end, Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock are talking about how, you know, relationships born out of extreme situations don't often last. Uh, something else I wanted to add that I think is interesting with that love triangle is that very frequently with, uh, particularly in YA novels where you've got a love triangle, it's basically, you know, dark-haired white guy and blonde white guy, which we have that again here, but they're both more or less kind of the same. Maybe one's a little more of a bad boy, but in The Hunger Games, what is really interesting about the love triangle is that we see a, a difference in Katniss's behavior with each of the guys, because with Gail, she behaves more in ways that are more typical of heroines throughout literature in that she is more of the caregiver and a little more passive, whereas with Peta, he's more of the caregiver. He's more concerned with her well-being, um, and she's the active one. So that's also part of why, well, part of many reasons I think it's more interesting and rad that she ended up with Peta rather than Gail. It seems also like a statement on toxic masculinity, right? Because at first... I was maybe a little bit Team Gale, at, you know, early on in the novels, but I increasingly moved um, to Team Peta because I didn't like Gale um, in Mockingjay, and I didn't like him in Catch um, Catching Fire either. He was so critical of her all the time and the choices that she had to make that she didn't necessarily want to make. Mm. Um, and we especially see in um, Mockingjay sort of a hot and cold nature to their relationship. Um, and, and we know Peta is, is psychologically tortured and comes back um, with, with some mental illness um, and some trauma that's going to last. But when he does recover himself, he's a different kind of man compared to Gail. He is more nurturing. Um, he is more willing to let Katniss take the lead. But he also does push her in ways that help shape her into a better person. Um, he just does it um, without any kind of real violence behind it, um, with the exception of when he comes back after being hijacked. You won. You survived the Hunger Games. Uh, th I think this is especially for our psychologists uh, in the panel. Well, that would include me, but we've already got two of you. Uh, <laughs> how does that affect a person? Is, is, uh, is it going to be PTSD, post-traumatic growth, or what? For most of them, 
probably PTSD. Um, probably for some of the careers though, the, the district one and two entrants, we're going to see post-traumatic growth because the trauma is not going to traumatize them in the same way because they're so prepared for it. So it's going to feel a lot more victorious, but for somebody like, you know, Katniss who has like numerous, numerous symptoms of PTSD that she's still, you know, actively hallucinating. She can't pull out of the Hunger Games and, and she and Pete even have conversations about how like, it's like they've never really left that arena. Um, so I'm going to say, yeah, we're going to have a lot of PTSD across the board. I mean, even Hamish, who's Hamish. decades older, he is still badly coping. When we first meet him, we think that he's just a drunk and a jerk, but we see no, he is heartbroken over what he had to do in the Hunger Games. He's heartbroken after, after having to see year after year after having to watch these tributes constantly die. So he is a drunk and he is distant because it is his very bad coping mechanism. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I definitely would, one, I would say that the first thing you'd probably recommend to these people is therapy. You're not really, you're not getting it there. I didn't see a single psychologist character in the book, so not a thing. Um, but the other thing is it, from what, particularly um, with Finnick, what you see is that um, even after the games are over, you're still being sold to people. You're still being psychologically tortured by Snow, and I'm assuming anybody before him. Um, I, I just think like it, it never really stops. Like there's never a chance to say, okay, now I'm going to go home and now, now I'm going to take care of my own recovery because you're still in it. Mm -hmm. He much, we find out like his girlfriend and his family were systematically killed off, um, over and over again. Um, Joanna, the same thing. She tells us, you know, she has nothing left. Um, so I, I, I can only imagine just, um, the constant stress you're under. And we see that in Catching Fire when Katniss realizes what the stakes are, that there is no safety afterwards. What, what's the best thing about the Hunger Games as, as a story, I mean, for us? For me, it's seeing, um, a protagonist who actually has a reaction to things that happen to them. Because generally what we've seen is, you know, you go through trauma or you go through a big gun battle or you're killing people and then you're like, ah, now I'm kind of dark and I wear sunglasses. Like, that's <laughs> not, oh, that's not what would ha well, probably not what would happen, but I'm sure everyone wears sunglasses, but I, I think it's just nice to see somebody actually really having a lasting um, reaction to things. I think, you know, with a lot of the fiction that we consume, um, you know, as kids, we see all these people who just get over it and move on or, or have like a moment where they're like, oh, I miss this person. And that's it. There's no reaction. So you feel very alone. If you're actually having PTSD over something, you're like, well, they wouldn't. So I, I think it's really important to see a character who has reactions to things and doesn't get over everything, but still lives and moves on with her life. I'm done now, I swear. <laughs> I think what you just said about the, this example of people seeing those heroes and thinking they wouldn't and need examples where they see that they do is one of the smartest things I've ever heard, actually, Jen. <laughs> Thank you. I made my day. <laughs> I saw, I saw a meme on Facebook that said something like, you can't raise a generation of people on Hunger Games, Insurgent, Star Wars, and not expect a rebellion. So, you know, the fact that I think we're inspiring people to stand up for what they find to be um, systematic injustice, I think that that's an inspiring part of the Hunger Games, saying we don't accept the status quo. And for me, I liked the Hunger Games movies, especially um, in terms of them proving that you can make money using a movie with a female <laughs> main character, right? Which was a debate, apparently, until this movie came out. Um, so, you know, maybe we'll finally get like a Black Widow movie that's supposed to come out soon. And um, just proving that, oh, you actually can, you know, care about women. I saw a meme come up um, that was similar, and it was um, saying something along the lines of, how did you feel when you saw the old man in District 11 um, whistle Rue's tune and uh, do the, th the salute? Um, you can't feel support for him and not support Black Lives Matter. Right. Um, and that was really one of my takeaways. And again, it has to deal with the fact that I'm a, a rhetorician who does like social justice work. But um, 
it was huge to me to have this book and see it part of, of a, a genre of dystopian where we have teenagers in broken societies trying to knit these societies together and showing us what kind of change we can make um, when we do come together and we fight, when we resist. And that resistance can look like all kinds of things. It can be, it can be physically violent, but it also can um, include other ways of making change. I mean, we see that with and the, and the beauty he puts into the world too that's so valid and so for me you know that's the most inspiring thing um about the books is and, and the movies too are the scenes when we see the districts come together and fight back um that's really powerful to me i didn't see a meme related to mine but depending <laughs> on what Deidre and wind were saying uh yeah i like that the hunger games stories portray systemic problems yeah. as being the root of problems because it's it's far too simple and it's far too easy for a lot of stories to say well this the system is fine it's fine that this kingdom has an oppressive monarch because if you get rid of that bad monarch then we'll have a good king who'll take care of everybody um but the the hunger game shows like yeah i mean it's obviously things are worse when you've got someone oppressive and fascist in charge but when the problems are systemic you need to break the system and rebuild it and i think that's a powerful and important message and a message that too few stories will focus on and instead we'll just focus on the easy fix of well we got we got that mean old king back in charge now we've got a, a nice a slightly nicer case he's, he's a little nicer king I absolutely agree uh, with what rewatching it now is just such a different feeling with everything that's going on and you definitely see the way they use the different districts and all of that and everything is just it's total manipulation to keep everybody on edge and to keep everybody antagonistic towards each other and you know you, we, we can see mirrors of that in, in the real world so i absolutely watching this film now it's like watching it again for the first time for people who want to praise you or curse you after this video comes out uh where can every people find you online i am at superherologist uh, one of the 10 most followed psychologists on twitter just look for travis langley Woo! twitter or facebook i'm easy to find I'm Jenna, at Jenna Bush everywhere of the USCH um, because I get uh, I get daily messages for the other Jenna Bush. So just we both have a check mark. Just I'm the other one, um, and I have a podcast called um, Hysterical. It's H I S T E R I C A L. So you can find us everywhere. Hysterical Pod. I'm the only Wind good friend as far as I know. So if you Google me, you will find me. I'm on Twitter at Deidre Garriott on Facebook. Uh, Deidre Ann Evans Garriott. Um, so those are my most active places. Feel free to yell at me. I'm on Instagram at Creative Combat and Facebook at Creative Combat. So uh, you can find out everything that I'm doing there. And for the people who want to say nice things to me, I am Alex Langley at Rocket Llama on Twitter and uh, RocketLlama.com. And for the people who want to say mean things to me, I don't have a Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Peace out. Thank you. <laughs>